verse 17. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And over to John. John chapter 9, verses 35 through 41. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this, and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Amen. What it takes to make us see. One of the purposes of Jesus coming was to teach us to see. The way of understanding what it means to a Christian is the new way of seeing all of the common experiences of life that come. One of the reasons Jesus came was to enable us to look at birth, marriage, and work, and daily life, and suffering, and death, death, with new depth and appreciation in common everyday experiences. The question becomes, how do we learn to experience life as Jesus did? What does it take to make us really see? One clue permeates the Gospels. To see life as it really is, we have to look honestly at death. In a basic sense, death reveals how to live a worthwhile life. When we admit that we do not have forever, we become a little more alert to the present. Trust me, I experienced that last week. When I bounced down the stairs on my head, I thought I was dead. It showed me how uncertain life is. But you know, most of us fail to see the reality of life. In our attempt to escape the reality of death, we tell ourselves that we have forever and that experiences today will be our experiences tomorrow. We live as though we have an unlimited amount of time and resource and therefore any particular thing does not have to be viewed with intensity or seen in depth. Jesus was a man who lived with a consciousness of the limits of life and death. He knew that his time was not unlimited. He said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man shall work. It is in light of the limits of life that he looked so carefully and so piercingly at everything and everyone. Why don't we see as Jesus saw? Because we are trying to escape the reality that we do not have forever. The preachers of yesteryear or former times 
were good at telling deathbed stories. Their value was not in scaring people out of hell, but in scaring people into living now. Into living now. For we do not always have tomorrow. And I'll tell you, at 5.30 in the morning, on last Friday, I didn't think I had a tomorrow. It makes you look at it a little bit differently. We will see as Jesus saw, when we take seriously the blinding power of our own self-centeredness. Aren't I awful? From Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town, disillusioned Emily goes back to the grave, and she is confronted by Simon Stimson, a man bitter in life and evidently clutching his bitterness even in death. And to Emily he says, now you know, that's what it was to be alive, to move about in a cloud of ignorance to go up and down, trampling on the feelings of those about you, to be always at the mercy of one self-centered passion or another. Now you know. That's, that's the happy existence you wanted to go back to, ignorance and bliss. In all of our vision, there is a selectivity process going on. <coughs> We see certain things, and we are blind to others. Perhaps the most blinding force of all is putting myself at the center of life and making everything else revolve around my presuppositions, my preconceived ideas and prejudices of life. Jesus' conflict with the Pharisees in New Testament days was at that point. Jesus said to them, You are blind to things that are happening around you, because you think you already understand. Seeing, you do not see. Hearing, you do not hear. And being in the presence of the miracle of God's revelation, you continue without experiencing the redeeming love of God. Those are harsh words. We will never see life as Jesus saw it until we recognize our inability to look at new truths. I can get off on a tangent here, but I won't. A young monastic student was working to understand the writings of Aristotle about the natural world and the heavens in light of his direct observations. And looking through a lens at the sun one day, he saw something he had not recalled reading in Aristotle's writings. Excitedly, in the joy of new discovery, he raced to his teacher to say, I found something. I discovered some spots on the sun that are not mentioned in Aristotle's works. And he was excited. But he was quickly deflated when his teacher calmly said, If the spots are not mentioned in Aristotle, they are either on your lens or in your eye and he would not look. Now doesn't that sound like a lot of church people? We already know it all. You can't tell us anything. We do not see because we assume we already know. We are content with our present position. Jesus was constantly inviting people to come and see. He encouraged persons to break out of their self-centered way of seeing things. 
And today, he invites us to come and see if there is not some new thing that can come out of Nazareth. He invites us to some new discoveries that can be found in the common ventures of life from his perspective. We will not see until we realize that we have to look through the eyes of others. <coughs> How often have we heard songs sung, you know, I want to see through your eyes, or through the eyes of a child? We have to look through the eyes of others. Humanity does not have to start over fresh with the birth of every new baby. We are recipients of that great body of insight, knowledge, and culture that comes down to us. The critical question is, through whose eyes will we look? <coughs> whose eyes do we choose to make our own? Whose experience will we share? This is the principle of revelation. It is the principle, principle behind Jesus coming to us and sharing himself and his understanding of God. That's why he came. Never mind assuming that you already know it all because you've sat in the church pew for the last 30 or 40 years. Jesus came to show us a new way of looking at God. He says to us, in effect, look at God, look at life, and look at your total experience through my eyes. Meaning his. Christian discipleship involves seeing life through the eyes of Jesus. It means seeing nature as the arena of God's creative act. Seeing people as beings in whom God's image dwells. Seeing the infinite possibilities in every person. And perceive the working of God for good, even in the most tragic moments of life. Does that sound like the way we look? I don't think so. But that's what Jesus wants us to do. Look at these things through his eyes. If I look at you through the eyes of Jesus, will I see something different than I look at the way when I look at you through my eyes? That old drunk down there, you look at him and you think, oh, he's always drunk. I wish he could smarten up. Well, what would Jesus think? How would Jesus see him? He sees people as beings in whom God's image dwells. And so often we miss that. Many people try to escape life. Others do not like the lives they are now living. They want to become or to be someone else. Or they want to have something more. Or they want to do something different. Or they want to go somewhere where they've never been. The gospel is not a ticket to escape from life. But rather it is the means of seeing life in a new way. And affirming it with new meaning and hope. Christian faith is the way of looking at the common experiences of life through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us come before the throne of grace and prayer. Divine love, 
who does everlastingly stand outside closed doors of our lives, knocking ever and again. Give us grace now to throw open all our soul's doors. Let every bolt and bar be drawn that has ever robbed our lives of air and light and love. Grant each of us grace to pray. Give me an open ear, O God, that I may hear your voice calling me to a higher ground. Too often have I been deaf in the appeals you have addressed to me, but now give me the courage to answer, Here am I, send me. Give me an open mind, O God, a mind ready to receive and welcome such new light of knowledge as it is your will to reveal to me. Let not the past ever be so dear to me as to set a limit to the future. Give me courage to change my mind when that is needed, that my life may be a continuing growth and maturing. Give me open eyes, O God, eyes quick to discover your indwelling the world that you have made. Forgive all my past blindness to the grandeur and glory of nature, and to the charm of little children, to the sublimities of human society, and to all the limitations of your presence that these things contain. Give me open hands, O God, hands ready to share with all who are in want the blessings with which you have enriched our life. Deliver me from all meanness and bitterness. O oh, Father, as you are open to all the world in love, may we be open to one another as brothers and sisters. Bless all families in bereavement and strengthen us all as we share their sorrow. Encourage the sick with the experience of your healing grace that minister wholeness that transcends physical illness and infirmity. May those facing new experiences not be intimidated, but be open to receive the full blessing of their opportunity. Our plea, O God, and in your mercy, give heed to our supplication. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So let's turn to our closing hymn, hymn number 185, Part of the Herald of the Lord. 